to the dictionary I hold in my hand. Terror is violent or destructive acts, such as bombing, committed by groups in order to intimidate a population or government into granting their demands. So what's a terrorist? They're calling me a terrorist, like they don't know who the terrorist When they put it on me, I tell them this, I'm all about peace and love. Like the ragheads and packies are worrying your dad But your dad's favourite food is curry and kebab It's funny but it's sad How they make your mummy hurry with her bags Rather read the sun and study all the facts Tell me, what's the bigger threat to human society? BAE systems or homemade IEDs Remote control drones Killing off human lives Or mad with homemade bomb committing suicide I know you were terrified When you saw the towers fall It's all terror But some forms are more powerful It seems nuts How could there be such agony When more Israelis die from peanut allergies It's like the definition didn't ever exist I guess it's all just dependent who your nemesis is Irrelevant, how eloquent the rhetoric peddler is they're telling fibs now, tell us who the terrorist they is They're calling me a terrorist Like they don't know who the terrorist When they put it on me, I tell them this I'm all about peace and love They're calling me a terrorist Like they don't know who the terrorist Insulting my intelligence Oh, how these people judge Look, mum, what was the mum? Mossadegh was democracy, and they was democracy, hypocrisy, it bothers me Call you terrorists if you don't want to be a colony Refuse to bow down to a policy of robberies Terrorism, my lyrics, when more Vietnam vets Killed themselves after the war than died in it This is very basic One nation in the world has over a thousand military bases They say it's religion, when clearly it isn't It's not just Muslims that oppose your imperialism It's Hugo Chavez, a Muslim Nah, I didn't think so, it's Castro a Muslim, nah, I didn't think so It's like the definition didn't ever exist I guess it's all just dependent who your nemesis is Irrelevant how eloquent the rhetoric peddler is They're telling fibs, now tell us who the terrorist is They're calling me a terrorist Like they don't know who the terrorist is When they put it on me, I tell them this I'm all about peace and love Greetings, greetings. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening for the third webinar in our Pan-Africanism and Anti-Zionism Political Education Series. My name is Onya Sanwu Chateauye. 
I am an organizer with the All African People's Revolutionary Party and the All African Women's Revolutionary Union. I'm also an editor for Hood Communists, and I'm one of the organizers of this webinar series alongside the South Florida Coalition for Palestine. I would like to first thank the many wonderful revolutionary anti-imperialist and African organizations and Palestinian organizations that have sponsored this series and helped us put it together. That includes the Black Alliance for Peace, the Hood Communist Blog, Students for Justice in Palestine, and Al Adwa, the Palestine Right to Return Coalition. So this is webinar three in our four-part series. And so far, we have unpacked the contradictions of settler colonialism and imperialism and explain unequally how ill a legal settler colonial state and Zionism is a project of white supremacy. We have gone deep into a critical analysis of narratives of terrorism, of narratives that demonize resistance of Arab men, of Palestinian men to Western imperialism. This evening, we're going to address head on a hot topic in the global struggle to liberate Palestine and to liberate Africa. And that's the narrative of antipathy between the Arab liberation struggles, the Palestinian liberation struggle, and the African liberation struggle. Um, we are, as Pan-Africanists, as revolutionary socialists, as internationalists, in complete solidarity with the Palestinian struggle against Zionism and the struggles against of all people, including Arab people, against imperialism. We recognize that we have a shared enemy. We recognize that we are in the belly of the beast. We recognize that we have a duty to struggle together. And we also recognize that one of the primary strategies of imperialism to keep us divided, to keep us confused, is to weaponize the tactic of divide and conquer to turn us against each other. So we are too busy fighting amongst ourselves and not busy focused on the greater enemy, which is Western imperialism led by the United States. So today we have two speakers, both comrades of mine, the All-African People's Revolutionary Party, giving a revolutionary pan-African and anti-imperialist political analysis of the need for unity between the Palestinian and Arab national liberation struggles and the African liberation struggle. We're gonna be talking about what that divide and conquer strategy looks like, exactly what are the details, what are the receipts, what are the strategies. We're gonna be talking about the long history of solidarity between our struggles. We're gonna be talking about how Israel, although it attempts to sow confusion and division, is actually the primary antagonist for Palestinian people and a deep antagonist of African people. We're gonna talk about Israel training police forces in the US, Israel's exploitative efforts in the African continent, all the ways that Israel supported reaction all around the world and how Palestinians are on the front line of that. So um, some logistical details to keep in mind as we go throughout the webinar, we will have a Q&A with both presenters at the end of our session today for the last 30 minutes. If you have questions that come up um, during each of their presentations, you can submit those questions using the Zoom Q&A function. Um, you can find that if you like hover over the toolbar on the bottom of your screen, the Q&A is like two chat bubbles, it's right in the middle. Click that and you'll see a way to submit your questions and we will see them and they can be selected to be asked during the Q&A. We are also streaming this webinar live to the FRP International YouTube and Facebook channels. And so after we're finished today, if you want to review the webinar again, or if you want to share it, and please do with your comrades, you can find that entire recording on the FRP YouTube channel. So now I'm gonna get into the meat of the content. We have two incredible dynamic speakers for you today from the All African People's Revolutionary Party and the All African Women's Revolutionary Union. First up, I have the honor and pleasure to introduce my comrade Jamila Bordan. Jamila Bordan is a member of the Black Alliance for Peace, as well as the All African People's Revolutionary Party and the All African Women's Revolutionary Union, where she's been organizing since 2014. As a writer, her works have been published in various places, including Hood Communist. As an organizer, she has contributed to the formation of the School of African Roots in Portland, Oregon, along with an associated free community breakfast program. Through the work, she emphasizes the importance of a strong combination of gender, class, and land analysis. She is humbled by whatever opportunities are available to build the party and to serve the people. Thank you so much, Jamila. Thank you. It's, again, I'm so humbled to be here. I do want to say, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that I am sitting on Lenny's Lenape land on Turtle Island. 
This acknowledgement must be the place we start from to address the contradictions we are discussing this evening. So thank you. So as our session is discussing the negative effects of Zionism upon our African population at home and abroad, I shall open with a couple of quotes from Nelson Mandela, now lionized as a man of peace and compromise, but was a direct enemy of the West and its allies, placing him on the US terrorist watch list until 2008. From Mandela, quote, if one has to refer to any of the parties as a terrorist state, one might refer to the Israeli government because they are the people who are slaughtering defenseless and innocent Arabs in the occupied territories. And we don't regard that as acceptable. Also, the temptation in our situation is to speak in muffled tones about an issue such as the right of the people of Palestine. We can easily be enticed to read reconciliation and fairness as meaning parity between justice and injustice. Having achieved our own freedom, we can fall into the trap of washing our hands of the difficulties that others face. Yet we would be less than human if we did so. It behooves all South Africans, again, erstwhile beneficiaries of generous international support to stand up and be counted among those contributing actively to the cause of freedom and justice, end quote. We must be incredibly discerning and we must educate ourselves before we stand in favor or against a political force or movement. We must never, as Mandela also spoke about, think of the enemies of the West as our own enemies. If one's political analysis regarding injustice in the US is not tied with whatever injustices occur for the people of Palestine, then one must recognize how myopic that analysis truly is or as I've once written in an essay, quote, if you claim to have supported all of these social justice movements and yet currently disagree with the fight for Palestinian people's self-determination by any means necessary, then you must ask yourself if you actually support social justice movements or a certain hygienic perception of it, end quote. As each of us is working to find our place in this world, we may gravitate towards an ideological perspective or analysis that ties in with our particular worldview at any given time. If the perspective or analysis is again myopic, we may view our own struggles singularly and disregard past and present mass liberation movements ultimately connected to said personal or domestic struggles, leading us to think other struggles are antithetical to our own. An example of this myopia is the sentiment that the struggle for Palestinian liberation is not our struggle as African people, not only because we must deal with problems locally before we can focus on international issues, but also because Arabs don't like us. You can guarantee that a person who thinks in this way has very little historical or anti-imperialist analysis built into the work they do. While the position is naive at best and injurious at worst, even if one claims to view the genocide of Palestinian people as insignificant in comparison to what's happening to our African relatives and ancestors in both the past and present, it would take a certain level of apathy to ignore the inextricable link of material realities we share with our Palestinian comrades. The economic, ideological, and state-sanctioned violence sold out to the masses share stark similarities from economic and educational disparities, urban renewal projects to police terror. As many of us watch in dismay the destruction of housing and hospitals at the hands of the Israeli Defense Forces and the displacement slash ethnic cleansing of a people, as we see and hear Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu emphasize the need for control of all the territory for the foreseeable future, end quote, we can point to the role of government sanctioned land acquisition or eminent domain in the displacement of African families in the US. Universities and hospitals could uproot self sufficient communities at the behest of the government as long as the families were compensated. While someone's immediate reaction may be, well, at least they were compensated. While well, someone's immediate reaction may be, again, well, at least they were compensated, excuse me, no amount of compensation can replace the years of cultural connections and community building. 
It's also crucial to consider that said compensation most likely was not an adequate amount to be able to move forward in sustainable ways. Examples of eminent domain would be the uprooting of Linentown in Athens, Georgia in the 1960s, where the University of Georgia built the Russell Hall, Cresswell Hall, and Brumley Hall campuses in its place, as well as Portland, Oregon, where myself and Anya Sanwa lived, <laughs> between 1971 and 1973, where 171 houses were destroyed in order to accommodate the building of an extension of a manual hospital. This extension was never built due to funds running out and promises of new houses being built to replace the ones which were destroyed were never fulfilled. It's also important to note that Oregon was only in the state constitution, the only state that had a constitution upon its formation in 1859 to have black exclusionary laws built into it. Asian exclusion laws were also included. The exclusionary laws were initially passed on June 26, 1844, prior to becoming a state. Included in the first of these laws was the prohibition of free Africans moving into Oregon County. If this law were to be violated, the person would receive, quote, not less than 20 nor more than 39 strikes, end quote. Despite slavery being outlawed in Oregon County, forced labor was still a policy as a move from the distributing of lashes. After the period of enslavement, the enslaved African would be removed from the county. Just as the Israeli Defense Forces or the IDF are considered an occupying force, police present which is increasingly comparable to an actual military force, in the U.S. is also considered an occupying force in the heaviest surveilled areas. The more militarized the police become, the more the masses will be perceived as hostile enemies of the state, and in some cases, enemy combatants. One of the few who were sentenced for the murder of a person whose punishment was far worse than the perceived crime they committed, and I say perceived, because the notion of crime in this country is constructed by a model that benefits those who have access to the most capital, many begin to tie Derek Chauvin's murder of George Floyd in 2020 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, to the collaborative exchange programs that have existed between Israel and police forces in the US. The Minneapolis Police Department's policy on neck restraints, as described, is a non-deadly force option. That's the quote defined as compressing one or both sides of a person's neck with an arm or leg without applying direct pressure to the trachea or airway, the front of the neck. Only sworn employees who have received training from the MPD training unit are authorized to use neck restraints, end quote. While Minneapolis has had policies regarding conscious and unconscious neck restraints on the books for years, these exchange programs should never be discounted and now part of my presentation will be a video discussing these exchange programs. Thank you. Concerned about. U.S. police are training in Israel, and that's something every American should be concerned about. As protests sweep across the U.S., it's becoming increasingly clear that law enforcement has become more militarized, treating the people they're supposed to serve and protect as a hostile foreign population. Part of the reason why is that since the 90s, and especially after 9-11, U.S. law enforcement, including police departments, the FBI, CIA, and immigration officials, have been trained by Israeli agents. These exchange programs are exacerbating the violence in both places and lifting up the Israeli occupation as a global gold standard for policing. And communities of color in the U.S. are disproportionately paying the price. Police, since its origins, have been a racist and brutalizing body. But through time, their efforts of brutalization have taken on a new character. That new character is police exchanges. Hey everyone, I'm Dina, and as a Palestinian-American journalist who's reported from the occupied West Bank... So put the camera down. Put the okay, okay. I've witnessed firsthand how Israel routinely targets unarmed Palestinians with force as part of its decades-long illegal military occupation of Palestinian land. I've also seen the militarized U.S. response to peaceful protesters in places like Standing Rock. And in this historic moment of uprisings in the U.S., the parallels between how American and Israeli forces crack down on civilians are more glaring than ever. 
So why is U.S. law enforcement receiving training from Israel, a flagrant human rights offender? And what does it mean for people on the ground? Now, it's important to keep in mind that the U.S. police and military have historically brutalized communities of color and repressed movements for justice well before the existence of Israel. But now they're building on that by learning from a state that has mastered racial profiling, crowd control, and surveillance. To understand why these trainings are so problematic, you first need some background about how Israel systematically dehumanizes the Palestinian population it completely controls. Israel's creation in 1948 enshrined a nationalist policy of Jewish-Israeli supremacy at the expense of the native Palestinian population, most of whom were forced to flee their homes, becoming permanent refugees. In 1967, Israel began its repressive military occupation of what remained of Palestinian land, subjugating the entire Palestinian population, denying them the rights of citizenship, and crushing any dissent against its policies. Since then, Israeli forces have routinely fired tear gas, skunk water, rubber-coated steel bullets, and even live ammunition at unarmed protesters. So this is a state that violently controls and suppresses the rights of an occupied people. And U.S. police are learning its tactics to use against American citizens. Thousands of law enforcement officials from all corners of the country have traveled to Israel to learn police strategies and exchange tactics. These trips became increasingly common after 9-11 as pro-Israel groups used the so-called War on Terror as an opportunity to push for a closer, unconditional alliance with Israel, which had marketed itself as the world's leading counterterrorism expert. On these trips, high-ranking U.S. officials are visiting Israeli checkpoints and prisons, places where human rights groups all over the world have documented Israeli discrimination and repression and torture and killing of Palestinians. I spoke to Stephanie Fox from the Jewish Voice for Peace. Her organization was part of a campaign called Deadly Exchange, which outlines the dangerous consequences of U.S. police trainings in Israel. Why do you think Israel is so attractive to U.S. law enforcement agencies? U.S. policing has always been both about enacting a war on black and brown communities in the U.S. and around the world. So I think that the two being both rooted in racism and state violence, there is a, a real natural attraction and a desire to trade tactics. So who runs these exchanges? They're organized by pro-Israel groups like the Anti-Defamation League, which calls itself the world's leading anti-hate organization. The trips are funded privately, as well as through grants from the Israeli and U.S. governments, including the Justice Department. The ADL boasts that they've trained more than 15,000 law enforcement professionals and have sent more than 200 high-ranking U.S. officials to Israel. And some officers fresh off these trips have high praise. This was an outstanding uh, experience, something that I'll remember for the rest of my life. You've obviously given us a lot to think about, a lot of best practices. And this is, in fact, the finest training initiative that I've ever been a, a participant in. But we've seen the ramifications of these trainings here in the U.S., with police departments treating American citizens who are exercising their constitutional right to protest as though they're under occupation, especially communities of color. Take Ferguson, Missouri, for example. After the 2014 police killing of Michael Brown, the officer's response to protesters mirrored some of the tactics used by Israeli forces against Palestinians, which civil rights icon Angela Davis has drawn attention to. The tear gas that was being used in occupied Palestine was the same tear gas uh, that was being used in, in Ferguson. And she's right. Officers in Ferguson used the same U.S. manufactured tear gas and flashbang devices to disperse crowds that Israeli forces regularly use against Palestinians. But that's not all. In 2011, the sheriff of St. Louis County, where Ferguson is located, traveled to Israel on one of the ADL-sponsored police exchange trips. And then, three years after the Ferguson uprisings, which catapulted the Black Lives Matter movement to the international stage, the city's police chief also traveled to Israel for training. He said he was blessed to be part of the exchange. And throughout all of this, Palestinians have recognized the shared struggle, even tweeting support and tips to American protesters. But Ferguson is just one example. Other cities and counties where officers have received Israeli training later became the sites of high-profile police killings. That includes Hennepin County, home to Minneapolis, where George Floyd was killed by police, and Atlanta, where Rayshard Brooks was fatally shot by an officer. And who could forget the militarized response to protesters in Washington, D.C. after the death of George Floyd? Officers from several agencies, including the U.S. Park Police, fired on protesters with tear gas and flashbangs. And it turns out that many officers from D.C. traveled to Israel for training, including the U.S. Park Police chief and a police commander. And then there's surveillance. 
Israel's massive surveillance system has inspired U.S. officials so much so that after a former police chief visited Israel in 2008, his city adopted its techniques. Our video integration center in downtown Atlanta is modeled after the command and control center I saw in the old city of Jerusalem. Atlanta has installed over 10,000 surveillance cameras, which have raised serious privacy concerns. But to really get a sense of Israeli inspiration, look no further than New York City. After 9-11, the NYPD and the CIA created a sprawling covert spying operation that surveilled and infiltrated mosques and Muslim neighborhoods in the New York City area. This led to widespread and unprecedented profiling of the region's Muslim communities. A police official told the Associated Press that the program was modeled in part off of how Israelis spy on Palestinians in the West Bank. That program was heavily scrutinized in the U.S., but widespread surveillance of citizens continues today. During recent protests, U.S. officials surveilled demonstrations in 15 cities using drones and helicopters. They've recorded almost 300 hours of footage which federal agencies and local police departments across the country can access. But it's not just the U.S. that's learning and implementing new strategies at home. In 2016, Israel copied New York City's highly controversial and racist police policy of stop and frisk. The Israeli version primarily targeted young Palestinian men who were detained and searched without probable cause. All that said, a few communities have stood up to these police exchanges and won. In 2018, Durham, North Carolina became the first U.S. city to ban its police from training in Israel. I spoke to Ajamu Dillahunt, a student and activist with Black Youth Project 100 who campaigned to make this happen. I saw the interconnectedness between uh, Black and Palestinian struggles. Because the United States and the state of Israel continue to strengthen their relationship, I think oppressed people within both of those places must also strengthen our relationship. In 2014, the NAACP had called the Durham Police Department a broken system in need of repair due to a troubling pattern of racial profiling and police brutality. And guess what? The department also had a history of training in Israel. The current police chief had previously headed Atlanta's Israel Police Exchange Program during her time with that department, so activists wanted to stop her from doing the same thing in Durham. Other communities have also successfully put an end to these trainings, including Northampton, Massachusetts, and the state of Vermont. But Ajamu says even though the win in Durham was exciting, racist policing isn't over. So while we got a major victory, that we really had to look at the struggle to end the exchanges uh, as part part of a broader struggle uh, to build a society uh, where police are no longer necessary. And I hope this current period of rebellion represents a new era of, of Black and Palestinian solidarity. Israel's occupation is illegal under international law and is premised on denying basic rights to the millions of Palestinians that Israeli forces control. Is that who we want American police who are already in need of so much improvement to be learning from? What do you guys think about U.S. police being trained in Israel? Let me know in the comments and be sure to check out AJ Plus's continuing coverage of Black Lives Matter protests and the uprisings against police brutality. I hope that video was helpful and we will post the video link in the chat pretty soon. Thank you so much. And we shall continue the presentation. Thank you. Well, the Anti-Defamation League, of course, the ADL, who was mentioned uh, in this video that we just saw, they state, they quote, stand in solidarity with the Black community who is yet again subject to pain and suffering at the hands of a racist and unjust system, end quote, as well as another quote, mourn for George Floyd, who was horrifically murdered by a police officer in Minneapolis, end quote. The irony of this statement amid the history of the ADL's attacks and surveillance on anti-Zionist Africans and anyone organizing and mobilizing for Palestinian liberation should not be lost on anyone. This is very much like Google and Amazon saying Black Lives Matter, while simultaneously contributing to the funding of policing logistics and infrastructure via collaboration with formations like the National Security Agency or NSA to surveil protesters and communities. And as they, like many, utilize the name Martin Luther King Jr. to hammer their point about opposing injustice, they ignore his anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist analysis that would very much apply to the economic and physical violence that Palestinians experience daily. Another aspect of the shared experiences of injustice between Africans, Palestinians, and the many other indigenous folks around the world are educational disparities. 
just as discussion of the humanity and culture of Palestinians or the history of the formation of Israel and the mass displacement that occurred are expunged slash censored from school lessons or on sponsored birthright trips in Israel. The struggle for African liberation is pathologized and curated to see Africans as defined primarily by their painful experiences. And even that is questionable, as we see some wanting to alter the language of forced labor as being equitable to employment. The opposition to critical race theory via lawsuits and laws across the nation, and the still almost ubiquitous condition interpretation that racism is based on individual thought and action, versus a system that holds root in particular laws and institutions is another way we can see these disparities playing out. As a counter to the myopia many of us experience, it is crucial we emphasize collective struggle through organization and political, organiza political education, excuse me. It is crucial we learn about other struggles around the globe and formulate united fronts to address these commonalities of oppression. In theory, we understand oppression anywhere in the world to always have been historically destructive and disruptive. This myopia potentially looks at particular types of oppression as being monolithic though, when it is suitable for an argument. While enslavement of a people anywhere is unconscionable, as Pan-Africanists, especially as we are in solidarity with the Palestinian liberation struggle, are sometimes asked why we do not emphasize the Arab slave trade, as Africans were the only ones apparently, according to this perspective, who were enslaved. The short answer is that Arab or any other form of slave trade was not motivated by profit, nor was it motivated by the specificities of racism in the ways enslavement at the hands of Europeans were. As a rib under the umbrella of war, gender-based violence upon enslaved women did occur. We still see evidence of this in every way, an era and iteration of war. Enslavement was also a rib under this umbrella, and to state that Africans sold other Africans to slavery in the same context of European-led child slavery is, again, myopic. It's a reading of history. The experiences we face in this day and age are in no way shaped by an era of slave trade. The transatlantic slave trade was a foundation to the building of the United States. It is the bedrock of what capitalism and its various appendages of imperialism, neocolonialism, settler colonialism, and fascism stand upon. Chattel slavery is firmly rooted in the structures of eminent domain, redlining, gentrification, and subprime mortgages from banks. Some, like Wells Fargo, HSBC, JP Morgan Chase, and Barclays, who profited off of enforced labor. Because conversation around enslavement of African people tends to be concentrated around a particular point in time, wage slavery is something some unfortunately view to be a myth. Via his Green Book, Muammar Gaddafi made an interesting observation regarding wage slavery. Quote, wage earners are but slaves to the masters who hire them. They are temporary slaves and their slavery lasts as long as they work for wages from employers, be they individuals or the state. The worker's relationship to the owner or the productive establishment and to their own interests is similar under all prevailing conditions in the world today, regardless of whether ownership is right or left. Even publicly owned establishments give workers wages as well as other social benefits, similar to the charity endowed by the rich owners of economic establishments upon those who work for them." End quote. In his defense of socialism as a solution to the economic problem, quote, the human being is essentially physically and emotionally the same everywhere. Because of this fact, natural laws are applicable to all. However, constitutions as conventional laws do not perceive human beings equally. This view has no justification, except for the fact that it reflects the will of the instrument of government be it an individual, an assembly, a class, or a party. That is why constitutions change when an alteration in the instruments of government takes place, indicating that a constitution is not natural law, but reflects the drive of the instrument of government to serve its own purpose." End quote. In his writings, he also openly apologizes on behalf of his people for any involvement in the enslavement of African people. Utilizing principles of Pan-Africanism, 
He facilitated meetings with African leaders who forged a unified, unified African economic system. In the prologue to the book of the relationship between Libya and the West, namely the US and its acronym, the Imperialist Appendage of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, the so-called black mercenaries alleged to be attacking Libyans have in turn been murdered, kidnapped, and enslaved. Once Gaddafi and the People's Jamahiriya could no longer physically hinder their preferred Western hegemonic project. As we must approach everything dialectically, while I will still continually insist on it being a myopic perspective, it's also understandable in some ways why anti-Arab sentiments exist among Africans and why there's somewhat of a universality around the thought that Arabs hate us. If we are to observe what people such as Tunisian President Kais Sa Saeed have said without one ounce of class analysis, it would be easy to slip into a mode of essentialism. In February of 2023, Saeed opined that immigration of sub-Saharan Africans was a conspiratorial plot to undermine a national Arab Islamic identity. Quote, there's a criminal plan to change the composition of the demographic landscape in Tunisia, and some individuals have received large sums of money to give residence to sub-Saharan migrants. Echoing former presidents of France and the US, not respectfully, Nicolas Sarkozy and Donald Trump, he equated what he considers to be these, quote, hordes of illegal migrants to be the source of violence, crime, and unacceptable acts, end quote. Without a class or anti-imperialist analysis, we see GB group tycoon and lone billionaire in Haiti, Gilbert Biggio, or some video of nightlife in Saudi Arabia as representation of what Arab money looks like. We don't necessarily take notice of the exploitation one performs in order to have access to that amount of wealth, or that the Minister of Foreign Affairs of also not so innocent Canada sanctioned Biggio due to, quote, illegal activities of armed criminal gangs, including through money laundering and other acts of corruption, end quote. That Arab people are a minority of the population in the Caribbean, yet are said to be some of the most successful business owners is something that, again, may give one pause. Some of these shop owners in both the Caribbean and in the US may have opened their shops from a petit bourgeoisie position with financial access to open it. It is when the shop owners enact racist or white supremacist behaviors or sentiments in the communities they open in seeing the shop only as an investment versus a community resource is when it becomes a problem. It is when we equate the petit bourgeois shop owner with the behavior of all Arabs that it becomes a problem. In reality, there has been a fairly well-documented history on the solidarity between and connection to the anti-Zionist, pan-Africanist, and anti-imperialist struggles. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense was seen as a symbol of self-determination around the globe, from the Dalit Panthers in India and the Black Panthers organization in Israel, who utilized the name because they were aware of how incendiary it was considered to be by the Zionists. Sadia oh, Marciano of the Israel-based Panthers, also an immigrant from Morocco, specifically and openly address what she viewed to be its shock value. Many in mass political struggles who appropriate the name black tend not to do it because of its racialized dynamics or categorization. Similar to how we in the All African People's Revolutionary Party, the AAPRP, identify as Africans, the approach to utilizing black as an identity is primarily political and ideological. The Black Panthers and Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, indeed have a history of anti-Zionist principles. One of the connections the Panthers in Israel made was the support of Fatah under the Palestinian Liberation Organization, or the PLO. The biggest connection made between all of these liberatory struggles is the understanding of the land question. As Shirley Graham Du Bois put it, while speaking to the liberation movements in Azania, quote, South Africa and Palestine land some 3,500 miles apart, but each the concern of the same imperialist interests, each sacrificed in the name of Western peoples and British empire building, end quote. Fatah, 
in a 1969 message at the Pan-African Cultural Festival in Algiers, also gave recognition to our collective struggles. Quote, on the map, there are two kinds of classifications, a geographical one and a political one, in which the world is divided into only two major continents. All the forces of revolution, liberation, and justice stand against the forces of colonialism, racism, and imperialism. Africa on this map is a cause more than it is a continent. We, therefore, came here as being part of Africa, the cause, although we are not from Africa, the continent. In conclusion, I'd like to say that these struggles may be present until the day each of us leaves this earth. However, I am confident that through sessions such as these, as well as our in-person mobilization and particularly organizational actions and efforts, we will win. It is crucial that we continue to build this work so when our physical bodies eventually do pass beyond this realm, future generations are able to do even better with the work we've left behind. I am grateful for this opportunity to participate in this session and I hope I have contributed positively to it. Thank you so much and forward ever. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamila. That was wonderful, incredibly comprehensive and essential analysis at this particular historical moment. Um, deeply appreciate and humbled by you sharing your knowledge here in our webinar. I have learned so much from you. Um, we are going to continue uh, the conversation with another speaker shortly, but just a reminder that as our, our speakers are presenting, if questions are coming up for you or things that you want to have discussed during the Q&A, please use that webinar Q&A function to submit your questions so we can ask uh, our comrade Jamila and our comrade Mark Pancher um, your questions at the end of the session. And speaking of Mark Pancher, I have, um, I am very grateful to introduce him to y'all now. Sorry, I'm doing double duty tech and MC. But Mark P. Fancher is a human rights attorney, writer, activist, and martial artist whose work has appeared in Black Agenda Report, Yes Magazine, LA Progressive, Black Belt Magazine, and out numerous other commercial and academic publications. Through his legal practice, Fancher addresses police violence, mass water shutoffs, and racial discrimination against students of color. His commentaries have addressed topics that include US military intervention in Africa and other underdeveloped regions, the criminal legal system, political repression, ongoing global campaigns for the independence and self-determination of Africa and the Africa diaspora, theology, and various issues related to racial justice. He is a member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party, the National Conference of Black Lawyers, and the Black Alliance for Peace, and he's also written several nonfiction books and satirical essays. His novel, The Negroes of Friends Village, is his first work of fiction, and Fancher's life and perspectives are guided by his Christian faith. So please help me in welcoming Mark P. Fancher, our next speaker. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much to our sister Jamila for her brilliance and genius. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, a good place to start the discussion is with the fact that uh, Zionists uh, have understood a lesson that we in the All African People's Revolutionary Party have been trying to teach our people uh, ever since the organization has been in existence. And that is the to understand the true nature of power and where it comes from. Uh, there are so many who believe that power comes from having lots of money. Uh, there are many people who believe that power comes from electing someone to a highly placed political office. Uh, but it, the truth is, and I think that most of us collectively understand at this point, that if that were true, then African people, particularly in the United States, would be among the most powerful people there are. Uh, we have more than a few people who have lots of money, whether it's Oprah, whether it's people who play professional sports, uh, whether it's anybody, people who we don't even know who have millions of dollars uh, and they have no power whatsoever. We have had a person who is African, biologically anyway, who was president of the United States and we still have no power. The fact is that power comes from the control of land and resources. And the question for anyone who is oppressed is, to, in what way can we get control of land and resources? People of the Jewish faith 
who underwent the horrors of the Holocaust uh, back in the 1940s, were asking themselves that question. And even before, because of persecution that they experienced because of their religious faith, they were asking themselves that question. And as a result of that, uh, a, a doctrine was developed uh, for people of the Jewish faith by people who were not necessarily uh, practicing Jews. Uh, this, this doctrine of Zionism was a political doctrine. It was based on the fundamental lesson that we understand now and that we're trying to educate our people about, and that is that if they were to avoid the persecution, if they were to avoid the marginalization, if they were to avoid the discrimination that they had been experiencing, they would need power. And the only way that they could get power would be to control land and resources. And so the doctrine of Zionism set about to try and acquire for people of the Jewish faith a national home. But when I say people of the Jewish faith, I'm speaking too broadly because if you want to know the truth about it, we're talking about not all Jews because there are people of the Jewish faith all over the world. There are people of the Jewish faith of all colors. There are people of the Jewish faith of all races. There are people of the Jewish faith of all ethnicities. But we're talking about, and let's be plain about it, we're talking about white Jews from Europe uh, who were looking for a place to establish as a national home. They were faced with a fundamental problem, and that is that their identity as people of the Jewish faith was one that was ba based on uh, the, the idea that they were faithful to a religious doctrine. It was not based on the fact that they were a people, close quote, in quote unquote. Uh, it was not based on the fact that they were truly a nation. It was not based on the fact that as a group, collectively, they were indigenous to a particular territory. Uh, it was based on their religious faith. And in order for them to have a right in order for them to be recognized as a nation that was under international law and otherwise uh, authorized uh, to occupy territory and to, and to control it, to administer it, to reap its benefits, then they would have to establish themselves as a nation. And thus the doctrine of Zionism was one that perpetrated a lie and continues to maintain it. And it's based on mythology. It's based on the idea that these people are a race of people whose lineage goes back to the people who are spoken of in the Old Testament. And anyone who does even a little bit of research would understand that that is fundamentally false. If we want to know what the people in the Bible looked like, all that we have to do is to look at the paintings that the Egyptians made of themselves. They painted themselves as looking very African. Their skin was always painted as brown to reddish brown to black. Uh, it was clear what they looked like. Why would they paint themselves otherwise? And we know that the Hebrews who were held in, who according to the Bible, were held in captivity uh, in Egypt looked like them. Moses was mistaken for one of them uh, when he was born. Uh, Joseph was mistaken for one of them. Uh, even in later years, uh, those who were members of that community, the community from which Jesus descended, uh, Paul himself, who was mistaken as an Egyptian. Uh, the scriptures talk about it. And so if they looked like the Egyptians, then you know what they look like. And we know what the white Jews look like who control Israel. And so it was based on a myth and it was based on a lie, and complicating their uh, practice of this new doctrine was the fact that because they were not a real nation, they were not a real group, they were not a race, that they were hard pressed to find a place that they could establish as their national homeland. They had to look around the world for it. And, and that is what began their connection and relationship to Africa. Because after looking, for uh, a place and finding and, and identifying initially uh, Guyana in South America as a potential location for the national homeland and finding that that would not work out, they actually seriously looked, seriously looked 
at trying to establish their national homeland in Uganda. And they pursued that for a significant period of time, but abandoned that uh, when they determined that the Mau Mau were too close in proximity. They were setting an example of resistance uh, and, and liberation struggle that they knew would uh, not permit them to establish the homeland in Uganda, and therefore they moved on. And Palestine was settled upon because of its connection, uh, its relationship to the experience of the Hebrews in the Old Testament, and the fact that there had been a prophetic promise that this would be their land. And so what they did is they said that they were going to establish their homeland, their national homeland in Palestine. And whereas scripture, whereas prophecy says that the Messiah will deliver that to them, these Zionists, who were not religious, said that they were not going to wait on the Messiah. They were going to take matters into their own hands and establish it there. As they began to do this, they had to find allies. And one of the first allies that they found uh, in their struggle was the first prime minister of apartheid South Africa, Jan Smuts. Jan Smuts bought into the idea of Zionism. Uh, he helped to promote and advocate it. Uh, and he explicitly accepted it because he recognized that it fit within an imperialist framework. If you understand that South Africa, apartheid South Africa, was based on a similar premise, and that is settler colonialism, where people who are not indigenous to a territory go in and take it over, settle there, occupy it, and oppress the indigenous population. And so the idea, the concept of having a national homeland established in Palestine to the detriment of the Palestinians, the people who were indigenous, was something that resonated with him. And it particularly resonated with him because of his acceptance, his endorsement, his belief in the idea of a global white empire. The fact that you have white people who are dominating the planet in all of its different regions, in all of its different territories. And so the idea was very appealing to South Africa that they would have another apartheid state located in Palestine and that the empire generally uh, that was dominated by Europe, by Britain, by the United States and other European Western powers was one that would benefit from having a territory in that strategic region. And it would make common cause with other members, participants in the global empire. And so Jan Smuts advocated it. Uh, it was through his efforts uh, and through his collaboration with Kaim Weizmann, uh, uh, you know, the, another pioneer Zionist, that they were able to ultimately uh, get from Britain the Balfour Declaration, which gave uh, an implied, if not express, authority uh, for the establishment of this national state in Palestine. And so the history began. Israel was established in 1948 formally. And in the immediate aftermath of that, uh, there were African countries that had cordial, if not friendly relationships with Israel. But all of that changed in the early 1970s. Uh, because it became increasingly clear over the passage of time that Israel was actively collab collaborating with apartheid South Africa. Apartheid had become the number one enemy of the African continent. From Cape to Cairo, there was resistance to apartheid. And it was the one thing that unified all of Africa during that period. And for Israel to collaborate with apartheid South Africa, to provide it with economic support, military support, police support, other support, was something that offended all of the African continent, and they severed their relationship with them. But Israel was persistent in its efforts to continue to try and dominate Africa and to control it and manipulate it. And it was arrogant and blatant in its continuing collaboration with apartheid South Africa. In fact, it hosted a state visit by John Vorster, and the entire time that Vorster was there, he, he applauded, he congratulated the state of Israel, 
and said that it was one of the best visits that he had, and they flew the South African flag the entire time. That was obviously offensive to Africa and African people, and they never forgot it. Israel continued its efforts to make inroads into Africa through the use of manipulation and trickery. Uh, it, it engaged sometimes in Machiavellian schemes, elaborate ones. One of the most significant is its dealings with Uganda. Idi Amin, uh, who many of you may know, who was uh, head of state of Uganda for a period of time, uh, was cherry picked by the Israeli government. He was taken to Israel and he was trained by the Zionists in military tactics. Uh, an elite squadron was trained along with him. And the purpose for his training was for him to go in and to stage a coup d'etat in Uganda to take control of it, and then to act as an antagonist uh, to neighboring Sudan. And the reason that they wanted him to antagonize Sudan was they were afraid that Sudan was going to make common cause with Egypt in a struggle and in a fight against Zionism. And so by having Idi Amin in place in Uganda, antagonizing Sudan and distracting them, then it would lessen the the likelihood that there would be uh, this combined effort of Sudan and Egypt trying to attack Israel. It's an elaborate scheme. It's Machiavellian. Uh, and, and what kind of a mind would think of it, a Zionist mind would think of it. But things did not go as planned because at a certain point, Idi Amin decided that he was going to become pro-Palestinian and anti-Zionist. And so, of course, Zionists, in all of their arrogance, felt quite betrayed by this. And they looked for the first opportunity uh, to somehow bring Idi Amin down. An opportunity to humiliate him and to uh, avoid or to at, at least uh, rehabilitate the humiliation that they felt uh, when Idi Amin began to do things like purge uh, his country of Zionists uh, and shut down their diplomatic relations and to send their diplomatic corps home. Uh, was when there was a hijacking of a, uh, an airliner uh, by Palestinian activists uh, who landed first in Libya for refueling and then went on and landed uh, at Entebbe in Uganda. Okay. And it was in Uganda that they were negotiating with Israel uh, for an exchange of the hostages that they had taken, the, the Israeli hostages that they had taken, for Palestinian activists who were being held in Israeli jails. Uh, the Zionists put together a raid, a military raid, wherein they came in and effectively uh, infringed upon the sovereign territory of Uganda without authorization uh, in international law, uh, without any right to do that, uh, against a country that was effectively defenseless against that type of an attack. Uh, for purposes of regaining or rehabilitating their image globally. Uh, and so we see the ways in which they've continued to interact, the way that they continue to deal with South Africa. And the point was not lost on those who were resisting uh, the, the apartheid regime. One of the first things that Nelson Mandela said when he came out of uh, prison was that he felt obligated and beholden uh, to the Palestine Liberation Organization for the support that it had provided in their resistance to apartheid. Uh, and this solidarity uh, has been a hallmark of the relationship between those who have been fighting for liberation globally. Uh, we've seen it even in, in current times. Uh, many of you may know that when Ferguson went up in flames, Palestinian youth, we're by social media communicating with the brothers and sisters in the streets in Ferguson and giving them tips and advice on how to deal with tear gas and how to withstand the attacks on them by police because they had experienced it. It is a relationship of solidarity which has continued to exist and which has reached perhaps one of its highest levels within the last few weeks as South Africa has taken uh, Israel to the International Court of Justice. 
it's a poetic kind of a result when we think about the fact that there was this collaboration between South Africa and the Zionists early on, uh, which helped to consolidate and reinforce the apartheid regime in South Africa, and South Africa having consolidated and reinforcing the strength of the state of Israel, for them to have had that relationship early on, for things to have come full circle, and through the struggles of African people globally, through the struggles of oppressed people globally, through the struggles of people everywhere against injustice, we have galvanized opposition not only to the concept of apartheid, but now increasingly to the very concept of Zionism. And so that there is global support, celebration of the fact that South Africa, which had suffered under the heels of apartheid and this, the heels of Zionism, has come forward and has challenged the state of Israel in the International Court of Justice. There are many who misunderstand the implications of this, the profound implications of them doing this. Them challenging Israel in this way is something that is unprecedented. Israel has been accustomed because of the protection that it has enjoyed from the empire over many years, it has been accustomed to being untouchable, to being a Teflon country. Anything that you throw at it rolls right off. But in this case, it is something that will stick because the International Court of Justice does not have the capacity. It does not have the authority. If it rules that, in fact, Israel is engaged in genocide, it does not have the capacity or the authority to go in and to take Netanyahu, Netanyahu or any of the others into custody and to jail them. No, it does not have that. But what it does have is global credibility. And so that a finding by that court that they are engaged in genocide gives license to all of the resistance that anyone has ever dreamed about to Zionism. A resistance that in other times and before such a ruling that might be regarded as quote unquote terrorism is no longer something that will have that type of stigma. It will be regarded as liberation, regarded under law as liberation struggle. Those things like boycotts which are now frowned upon and, and um, criticized and, and uh, the people who engage in the activities of BDS who are demonized and left and right, they will no longer be regarded as such because they're trying to stop a genocide. And so we have to understand the profound implications of this. It provides a license to resist in ways which, has not, which have not been possible in the past. And so it is a historic moment. Uh, it is one that I think that we all have an obligation to build upon and to try and work through. And it provides opportunities for education, for us to bring clarity to many of the people who have been confused. Historically, there, have, there has been a great deal of confusion about the state of Israel by even people that we as African people have honored and celebrated for many years. Dr. Martin Luther King was confused on this question, uh, did not understand it, and was looking at it perhaps through a religious lens, uh, perhaps through a lens that was in many ways affected by the fact that he had enjoyed such support uh, from the Jewish community uh, in his struggles and in the civil rights movement. Uh, there are many factors that may have influenced it, but increasingly we have, have achieved a, a higher degree of clarity and understanding across the board about where we stand. And the fact is that there is a clear, bright line between those who are oppressed and those who are the oppressors. And we know that the state of Israel, Zionism, as a doctrine and as a concept, is a tool of imperialism. It is a tool of Western capitalist states that has been used effectively for a very long time to lock down a region of the world where oil resources that they crave, that they cherish, that they covet are, are in, plentiful in plentiful supply. They have cherished and needed Israel in that strategic area of the world because in years past during the Cold War, it represented an opportunity 
for strategic advantage against the Soviet Union, the then Soviet Union, and now with their continuing rivalry and tensions that exist uh, with, with, with Russia. Uh, it has been necessary for them to have a presence there because of the hostility uh, that they face from many of the countries in the region because of their treatment of the Palestinians and the exploitation that goes on there. Uh, and so the, the efforts that the imperialists make to dominate the resources of that region, including their efforts now to try and get access to the, the newly discovered oil in Gaza, the efforts that the imperialists have made over an extended period of time to dominate and control the resources of the African continent the, the efforts that Zionism has made to try and dominate and control resources on the African continent. If we look, we see that there, is, there are shared interests among those who are Zionists and those who are imperialists. And we see that there are shared interests among those who are the targets and the victims of imperialism and Zionism. And so we know where we stand. To the extent that there has been confusion in the past, there is now clarity, and we must continue to organize, educate, and fight for justice, not only for ourselves as African people, but for all people who are the targets and the victims of the same enemies that cause us to suffer so much, that have imposed oppression on us, that have exploited us consistently over the many decades. And with that, I'll, I'll come to a close and uh, remain on standby for any further discussion or questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Comrade Mark Fancher, for that extremely clear analysis that is the political line of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. We have to recognize that the greatest beast that we are facing is the system of global imperialism led by the United States. We have to recognize that Palestinians and Africans are on the front lines of that struggle against global imperialism, and we have to unite to take it out. A victory in Palestine is a victory for African people, a victory for all people fighting against imperialism. A victory in Africa is a victory for Palestine. So now we are going to open it up to y'all, the audience, um, to ask some questions of our brilliant presenters, uh, Jamila de Bourdon and Mark P. Fancher. So we have some questions that we've been collecting um, from the Q&A throughout the course of the webinar. Um, and then we will, if you, you can continue to submit your questions and we have a, we're gonna have a 30 minute discussion. So um, I wanna open with a question for Jamila, specifically on the Arab slave trade slash Arab anti-blackness. How do we organize together while acknowledging these antagonisms that exist between our communities? Thanks for that question. I think, as mentioned, a class analysis is extremely important. As we've seen, you know, there are antagonisms, but there are also antagonisms between African people because of the class struggles we have. So there are people who are African who go to Africa and say they're re repatriating, but they enact the same uh, imperialist behavior. So I think we have to look at it in a sense of, are you uh, in line with the people struggle or the anti-people struggle? And so, you know, if we're just thinking of it uh, in terms of continually thinking of it uh, without a class analysis as Arab versus African, yeah, we're not going to get any other work done. But given the unity between Palestinians and as mentioned in both of our presentations, the alliances that have occurred, I think we can do some homework on that. We can, you know, a lot of us are on social media, so we can find that information and really say, hey, I want to work with you. This issue is very important to me. Um, you know, And one of the things is, and I love what Ajamu Umi always talks about, if you Ha, don't have an organization that you want to be a part of, create your own organization. So if you don't have an organization, say you have a Palestinian comrade and, oh, look, maybe the people in the motorcycle, I don't know if you hear that, but maybe they're organizing right now. Maybe they're going there. But if you have a Palestinian comrade and the area in the world you live at doesn't have an organization that is uh 
one that uh, discusses, promotes unity between Palestinians and Africans, create that organization. So organization is key. Continually doing political education is key. And never follow the Western regime of information because the 22nd response that I always give when people talk about this is the history of the U.S. is based on invading places around the world that are anti-imperialist or nationalist movements, or as Mark talked about, has particular resources that the West wants. And if you don't give it to them, well, we'll just take it by force. So yeah, really do a ton of study and really collaborate, organize, build your own organization if you don't have it, political education, those things are key. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mila. And then uh, the floor is absolutely open for you as well, Comrade Mark Fancher, if you have any thoughts. Otherwise, we'll move to the next question. Yeah, no, I, I, I was just going to say that, um, you know, I, I live and work in Michigan and uh, probably the the largest concentration Arab population is in Dearborn, uh, Michigan. And I can tell you that there is uh, a great deal of tension as between uh, Arabs uh, and Africans in this region. Uh, and there are many reasons for that. Uh, and so when we talk about uh, trying to build solidarity and working relationships between those communities, uh, there is sometimes some initial re, uh, resistance to that, uh, you know, because of those those tensions. But what's true of that relationship uh, is true of relationships that we see even within and among African people. Uh, you know, there are so many people in the diaspora, you know, Africans in the diaspora who say, well, you know, we don't have anything in common. We don't like those people from Africa and People in Africa say they may not like people in the diaspora. You have those kinds of things. That's not good. I think that we can we can work to try and build greater affinity and understanding. But I think the central point is that we're in a struggle for survival and we don't have to like each other. We don't have to go to each other's parties and weddings. We don't have to, but we do have to recognize that we have shared political interests. And we need to come together around that so that we can survive and continue to not be fond of each other if that's what we want to do. And, and, and so we have to explain that, that you, you don't like me, I don't like you, fine. Put that aside for the moment and let's look at this beast that's trying to kill us both and, and, and to organize and, and, and work uh, around that, that principle and that concept. I mean, the oppressors do it. I mean, you know, the the imperialists, they're, these countries, they don't, they don't, they don't like each other a lot of times, but they come together. I mean, back uh, when the uh, the French wouldn't support the U.S. invasion of Iraq, uh, you know, they had resolutions in Congress saying that they were going to rename French fries to Freedom Fries because they hated the French so much. But it didn't stop them uh, from coming together and working as a well-oiled machine to go in there and kidnap. John Bertrand Aristide out of Haiti uh, when he became an upstart. I mean, they worked together like a well-oiled machine. And then after they got him out of Haiti, uh, they went back to not liking each other. So, you know, we just have to not confuse those issues. Absolutely, thank you so much for that clarity. The necessity of recognizing that we are facing an enemy that is threatening to not, take, not only take out Africans, not only take out Palestinians, but take out the planet as a whole. We have a shared struggle, a shared enemy. We have to fight side by side. And it's not about whether we get along interpersonally, it's about the bigger picture, the primary contradiction. So another great question from the audience. Thank you for this webinar. I learned so much on the basis of Zionism and the unjust birth of Israel and its connection with imperialism in South Africa. I have a question for Mark Fancher. As a Jewish American myself, who learned about the Holocaust in my American public school education, why do you think that the Holocaust is labeled as a terrible genocide on the Jewish people by so many Americans, but Americans cannot fathom the idea that Palestinian people are also experiencing a genocide themselves? Why can't people in the US, especially Jewish Americans, see the connection? Well, I think that uh, we have to consider all of this against the backdrop of, of white supremacy uh, and um, chauvinism, ethnocentrism, 
Uh, and the fact that it's it's easier for people to relate uh, to people that they regard as their kith and kin. Uh, and so, you know, white people who see white people uh, being uh, killed in large numbers, uh, you know, taken into camp concentration camps, uh, placed in ovens, all the horrible things that were done to Jewish people in Nazi Germany, uh, they can relate to that uh, because they see themselves in that. Uh, but then when you start talking about the other, uh, people who have historically, because of doctrines of white supremacy, have been regarded as inferior, and in some cases, maybe not even human, uh, it becomes easier to dismiss it. And it has been necessary uh, to dismiss it uh, and to train people not to uh, empathize with the other, uh, because the United States itself as a settler colony uh, ha owes its existence to a process of genocide against the indigenous population in this hemisphere. Uh, they came in, stole their territory, and then set out on a course of trying to kill as many as they could. Uh, and, and the only way that you can square that with your conscience is to tell yourself that these are not really people, that these are not people that we can really identify with. And so the same kind of thing has happened in Africa, uh, and the same thing is happening in, in, in uh, Israel and Palestine, uh, where people are trained to really sort of regard the Palestinians as not, not really people. Uh, you know, they, they intellectually know they are, uh, but on an emotional level, they just don't really count them as being uh, on the same level uh, as, 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 you know, as, as, as people who are white and Jewish. And, and you can see that now, even since October 7th. I mean, how many people did Hamas kill? Okay, and then you, you compare that number with the number of people, the number of Palestinians who've been killed in, in Gaza. And yet, if you talk to some people, they, they honestly believe that the, the greater atrocity was the, the number of people who were killed, the, the number of Jewish people who were killed in Israel. Uh, you know, no death is good. I mean, we're not sitting, we're not saying that uh, that we're justifying any of that. But, uh, you know, the, the ability or the capacity to understand the humanity of others is very often lacking. Thank you so much. Uh, Jamila, any thoughts? I would definitely agree with that. Um, we've seen a lot of that. There were a lot of comments in relation to that uh, with the situation in Ukraine as well. And there has not been the acknowledgement of the, the overtaking of the democratic government in Ukraine in 2014. And then it was just a singular event. And it's also not tied to anti-imperialism. It's not tied to the formation of NATO as a means of destabilizing the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was to stabilize what, December of 1991, if I'm not mistaken? NATO still exists. So we can look at uh, NATO's involvement uh, when it comes to Libya. We can look at NATO's involvement around the world and the formation of uh, the Baltic states in the way they are now. And the whole crux of this is still Russia. The whole crux of this is still uh, fighting, destabilizing governments that are anti-imperialist or nationalist in question that are uh, not willing to participate in Western hegemony. And so when people are going on and on and on without historical context uh, about white supremacists and neo-Nazis infiltrating the Ukraine government and militaries and sympathizing with that, whether or not they know they are, and having no amount of empathy for what is happening to Palestinian people. I absolutely agree with Mark there. We need more empathy for sure. Yeah, and it's really interesting to point out the the way that the Zionist project depends on the dehumanization of Palestinian people. It depends on Israelis believing themselves to be intrinsically more worthy, like above Palestinian people, and how that process parallels the way that other settler states like develop the national identity of like the settlers. Like it's the same thing in the US where like African people, indigenous people, Hawaiian people, Puerto Rican people, where 
um, criminalized, we're dehumanized, we're racialized. Um, the 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 average white settler is considered like above us, like somehow inherently more civilized than us. So this is like a common strategy that imperialism and settler colonialism use. And there's like another corollary to the strategy um, that's known as like a like a settler move to innocence is what it's referred to in the in the paper. Decolonization is not a metaphor. That takes us into the next question I have for y'all, which is that how do you combat rhetoric that refers to Israelis as an indigenous people and to Zionism as a national liberation struggle? What are some ways to tell if a struggle is generally anti-colonial and anti-imperialist? Oh, I'll talk a little bit about that. The notion of being an indigenous person or being of indigenous people, I think a lot of people sort of misconstrue what that means. And if we do research, being an indigenous person is ultimately uh, a political statement. And so if Israeli people, people from Israel are saying they're indigenous to the land, um, the statements uh, to <laughs> you know, the early statements in the, the formation of early forms of Zionism would counter that. Zionism is literally stated to be a colonial project. So to <laughs> say, yeah, you know, we belong here and the Bible says we belong here. Uh, then what about uh, Christians who are Palestinian? Why are they attacked? If we're looking at the Old Testament and then the movement to Christianity, which, you know, it's been said by Christian scholars that, you know, Jesus was born in Palestine. So why are Christians attacked? Why? It's, a, this, it's very clear it has nothing to do with religion, and it has everything to do with, uh, as Mark stated again, it has to do with resources. They recently found oil, but it also has to do with land. And it has to do with the understanding that there are particular people that are indigenous to that land based on the amount of time they live there. And when you had 1948, those people were still there. So they are indigenous to the land. It is a, a political, for all intents and purposes, a political label and not necessarily like, well, I was born there, but I moved to Germany and then I came back. So I'm indigenous. That's not how it works. So yeah, I, I'm sure Mark will be a, a bit more eloquent than myself, but yeah. <laughs> I don't know about all that, but but I, I do think that the, the simple response to those people is you're a liar. Uh, because, I mean, look, I mean, let, let's, let's, let's use some common sense here. Okay, so you say that your people were, were taken into Palestine, you know, back in, in Old Testament days. Okay, I, I forget my numbers, but there were a handful of people a handful of Hebrews who went into Egypt, and then it came out 400 years later, okay, 600,000 of them. Now, who were those handful of people mating with? Uh, I, I think that they were mating with African people. And so if they went in there white, they didn't come out white. That's, 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 that's for sure. And, and then, you know, you, you, you think about it, Look, you know, Jesus, when he was an infant, uh, you know, Herod was hunting for his head. Uh, you know, he wanted, he was killing all the children, right? The male children. And so his family, in order to hide him, they took him into, into Africa to hide. Now, if, if he were a little blonde haired white baby, uh, then I think that when the soldiers came looking for him, I said, you seen a little white boy? He's over there. Everybody would know. No, I, I think he probably looked a lot like the local population. And so now here you are, as white as you can be, you know, claiming that you're indigenous to Palestine. Come on, give me a break. And, and, and I mean, you know, the, it, it, it's, it's, just, it's just lies that they tell in order to try and justify it. And, and what makes it so really disturbing is that they, they're not content sometimes uh, to just rest uh, on 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 the casual lie, they try and and put it into law. So settlers, you know, back in the in the 1500s, 1600s, when they were going around, you know, conquering lands and territories, and in law, it they they would come into a land and they would brand it as terra nullius, which means land occupied by nobody. 
So you come into the Americas and you got civilizations, highly advanced civilizations, uh, you know, communities of people with cultures, you know, great accomplishments, scholarly and otherwise. And you say that nobody's here. And so therefore we're taking it. And, and, and that's exactly what they did in Palestine. I mean, there were Palestinians there. I mean, why do you call them Palestinians? Because that's where they're from. And so you come in there and say, well, ain't nobody here. It's ours now. No, they're here. You drove them out. So I, I think we just have to be be quite plain and, 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 and blunt with them about the fact they're just lying and, and doing it arrogantly and shamelessly. And, uh, you know, just compounds the other crimes that they're committing. Without question, absolutely. Just make it clear as possible. A lot of time and energy is invested um, by the imperialist media, by the capitalist media, by the ruling class, by the political leadership in these capitalist and imperialist nations, um, trying to convince people that it's like an ancient, unknowable struggle. It's just so complicated, so confusing. And so just having this clarity, like cutting it right to the quick, like y'all people are Europeans. You stole this land. The you know, Palestinians and the indigenous people, like just make it plain, make it clear. It's not complicated. They want you to think it's complicated, but so you don't take the right position. Um, next question I have for you from the audience is, Historically, Black folks have been on the front lines for every movement. However, others do not show up the same way for us. Tear gas tactics aside, what more can the Arab population do to support Congo, Sudan, Haiti, and Tigray? And if you want to do some myth busting about Tigray in your answer, I would not be mad at you. <laughs> so either one of you. Um, I, uh, we've, we've actually discussed in the presentation and in the video, I mean, the, there were some collaborations. Uh, it had Fatah shouting out the Black Panther Party and SNCC. Um, I mean, you even had, you know, uh, when people were protesting in Ferguson, Palestinians gave tips on how to survive police terror. I mean, those are just a few examples right there. It does, it does occur, but as we keep talking about, Western capitalist media promotes this idea that it's not happening. And we have to understand that these constructs exist to assure that the masses do not organize, organize together. And so I, I think it's important for us to do our own homework. And I know there was a question about a book. So I will just, uh, you know, here's one. <laughs> so. So um, it is a book that does talk about uh, alliances and uh, inspirations from uh, the African liberation struggle. So th th there are some clear examples. Yeah, I, I disagree with the premise of the question. I, I, we do show up, but I think that others have shown up for us. I mean, and, and, and I think we have to be real clear. We're anti-Zionist, we're not anti-Jewish. And we have to give credit where credit is due. Uh, during the civil rights movement, there are Jewish people who put their lives on the line, uh, you know, as part of our struggle. Uh, Schwerner and Goodman lost their lives, uh, you know, for 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 our people. And so, you know, we 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 have to recognize and remember that. But beyond that, I mean, internationally, uh, our people have have really enjoyed lots of support from many places, and we just don't hear about it. Uh, when the Sandinistas first took control in Nicaragua, uh, the, 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 one of the first things that they did was to name Martin Luther King's birthday as a national holiday, and that's before the United States did it. And uh, they, they uh, otherwise um, commended and provided material support in ways that, that uh, we don't know about. Uh, Cuba uh, has been a consistent supporter of our struggles. Uh, anytime any of our revolutionaries have been in trouble, they've always been able to find protection and refuge in Cuba. Asada Shakur is there now, you know, because of, of them. I mean, and, and, you know, in so many ways they've supported us. Uh, when, uh, when we had Hurricane Katrina, uh, they, they mobilized hundreds and hundreds of doctors who were ready to go into Louisiana to provide support. And, uh, you know, it's just because uh, Bush wouldn't let them in that they didn't come. Venezuela, uh, you know, has provided all kinds of support. They provided uh, free heating oil to members of our community. And 
you know, we and going back to Cuba again, I just I'm lingering there because they've just done so much. Uh, but, you know, you, you should look at what Cuba did uh, in order to liberate, uh, you know, the, the southern the southern African region militarily and otherwise. And then when they negotiated their withdrawal militarily from southern Africa, they took nothing. They didn't take one nugget of gold from Africa. They just wanted the remains of their fallen comrades. And they left on May 25th, African Liberation Day. And the day after that, they sent plane loads of doctors. And when questioned about it, they said, well, we said we were gonna bring soldiers home. We didn't say anything about doctors. And over the decades, they have provided more medical assistance, more doctors and health professionals to Africa uh, than any other country in the world, even more than Africans. The Irish in their struggles against British uh, colonialism have stood in solidarity with African people uh, time and time again. Uh, the indigenous peoples in the United States have stood with us whenever we've needed it uh, and work in active alliance with us. Uh, so we've got all kinds of uh, you know, collaboration and organization uh, and uh, cooperation uh, with, with people from all over. And you know, the, the fact is, particularly for Africans in North America, they've always been seen as uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, an inspiration uh, to people who are struggling uh, around the world. You know, the, the, the Black Panther Party and organizations like that fired the imaginations of people who were struggling for liberation and they've looked to us. And it, it's, it's one of the reasons why I really get upset uh, when we have uh, people like Linda Thomas Greenfield, who's the UN ambassador, and uh, you know the, the Condoleezza Rices of the world and the Colin Powells of the world and the Barack Obamas of the world, uh, who carry the flag for imperialism and really confuse people who would otherwise be allied with us, thinking that all of us uh, you know, feel as they feel or believe as they believe. And so that our work in trying to reinforce and, and to bolster those relationships uh, is really important. Thanks to you both for that answer. And I agree, the, the premise of the question is flawed, specifically with Palestinian folks, and not just since October 7th, but since like the entire 10 years that I've been in the movement, we've been struggling side by side in the streets, like building these movements together, building organizations together, Filipino comrades, Palestinian comrades, Chicano comrades, Puerto Rican comrades, Cuban Solidarity Movement comrades. I feel like when you're in it, you see this entire network of solidarity, this like mosaic of solidarity, but like from outside, the discourse is all, we're, no one's helping us. We're all on our own. We show up for everybody, but they don't show up for us. And I'm like, what are y'all, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> like we show up for each other every day. And it's because again, there's like a deep understanding that we have a common enemy, that this common enemy is going to take out all of us in this planet and that we can only take it out together. Like that is the basis for why we're in the streets side by side why we're sharing strategies, why we're we're building deep knowledge of each other's struggles. I feel like the way the African liberation movement in the US responded after October 7th, like showed the clarity and also showed the relationship that had been built over the long term. Like even like some of the most liberal folks who I never would have expected to take an anti-imperialist position were like from the river to the sea because they those like ties had been built over decade, like over 10 years or longer, like of just educating each other and building together. So like, absolutely, Palestinian folks have showed up for us and we show up for them because it's like in our interest, but also because they're our comrades. Um, but uh, uh, a couple of things, a couple of times you both discussed um, Israel's ventures in the African continent, both in terms of like the statecraft, like manipulation um, in places like Uganda and also in terms of resource extraction. So the question I have for y'all is, why is Israel so interested in Africa? Why did they want observer status in the African Union? What is the nature of Israel's ventures in the African continent? I think part of it is uh, in, uh, an aspect of hegemony, an aspect of um, access to resources like diamonds, which that's happening and an aspect of assuring that Africans don't unify against Zionism and imperialism. So we saw what was happening with Muammar Gaddafi 
in unifying Africa and the result of that. So imagine if, you know, even after Gaddafi's gone, the work that he advocated for putting in place were to continue. And so Israel's role uh, at the behest of U.S. tax dollars in particular is to assure this doesn't happen. And so, I mean, obviously that's not the fuller picture, but I, I do see that as being part of the picture. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think that um, Israel has, from its beginning, uh, been a country under siege, and and there is a siege mentality that they feel, uh, and 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 with good reason. Uh, you know, they've really brought it on themselves. Uh, but a big big part of them feeling secure is establishing. Uh, or creating conditions around the world that uh, discourage or deter uh, a, a growing anti-Zionist sentiment. Uh, they don't. They don't want to become so totally isolated. Uh, whether they consciously looked at it or not, they 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 could look at what happened with apartheid South Africa, where the world just uh, completely isolated and marginalized that regime to the point that it eventually. Uh, collapse politically anyway, and and uh, they 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 sense that. So there's a need for them to continue to try and and build as much um, sympathy, or to, you know, to try and get you know people to to line up with them. And then then they 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 they, they use every opportunity to do it. Um, you know, one one of my former pastors uh, was invited um, on. A, uh, with a delegation of uh, African uh, theologians and, and preachers to tour Israel, uh, you know, where they were given a propaganda tour, you know, to just try and, and continue to build this idea that uh, we're all in this together. You know, we're, 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 we share a theological, uh, you know, we have a theological connection, you know. Um, and so they strike at every level. And, and one of the ways that they're dealing with Africa right now as I mentioned earlier on, that at one point all of Africa uh, had severed ties with Israel. Uh, there are a number of African countries which have uh, found their way back into relationships with Israel. Uh, but uh, these are neo-colonial uh, states that uh, have been willing to take uh, the the type of agricultural and uh, you know industrial and uh, infrastructure kinds of gifts. Uh, that Israel is providing uh, to countries that are, are desperately in need of, the, of the, those kinds of things. So I don't know that these are honest relationships or sincere relationships, but they exist nonetheless. And uh, Israel is not above having disingenuous kinds of relationships with, with, with others. They'll take whatever they can get. So Israel is basically part of this modern day 21st century scramble for Africa. It's as invested as looting and looting Africans' resources as any other capitalist and imperialist country. Also, great point about Israel wanting to avoid being completely globally isolated. I feel like we're like hurtling towards that conclusion because of the sheer number of people that have taken to the streets, calling for a ceasefire, calling for Israel to end what it's doing to Palestine. Uh, the ICJ case, like there's an increasing isolation. Uh, of Israel as a nation and Zionism as a political project that feels irreversible at this point. Like the veil has been lifted. Um, so it's an exciting time to be alive and it's the resistance of Palestinian people that got us to this point. And, and I, I actually believe that there will come a time uh, that the U.S. kicks Israel to the curb. It's not that the U.S. will abandon uh, its, its agenda, its imperialist agenda. It just will come to the conclusion that Israel is no, no longer useful to it. And it will groom uh, other countries in the region to play the role that Israel has played. Absolutely. I feel like, so Israel Israelis consider themselves above Palestinians. European Americans consider themselves above Israelis. Like Israelis are completely disposable. The US is the world's most fair weather friend. They will kick you to the curb. And I agree, I absolutely see that happening as well. Uh, Jamila, in your talk, you shared a quote by Nelson Mandela, um, where he talks about not making the West enemies our enemies. What does that mean, and why is it important to do? 
you are muted, comrade. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> it's important too, because again, uh, I think an example of this is we tend to lament police terrorism in this country. We tend to be saddened uh, when there is war. Of course, it's all encompassing war. But yet we still fall for these stories when it comes to Israel. It's coming from the same source. So why should we believe what happens in Rwanda from the West perspective and not do any homework on the history of imperialism that was the root of what happened? So we have to understand the root and not just believe the story. It's all coming from the same source. And that is why that quote is very important. Like We shouldn't consider uh, the friends of the West to be our friends and we shouldn't automatically take the enemies of the West to be our enemies. And so everything's dialectical. So I think uh, giving critique to a particular situation, or that, that's fine. Everything deserves critique. But to outright condemn, you know, the, this idea, oh, do you condemn Hamas? Do you condemn Hamas? Without acknowledging, is that the will of the people? Why do we have to just automatically condemn something or someone because the West says so? And we don't even really have any information. I mean, there are people who literally went and talked about how, well, you know, R Russia wants to turn into the USSR again. And okay, is that a problem? I don't, I, is, I, but is that really the case? Like, do we have any evidence of that? And so while we're making declarative statements about something with virtually no information, because that's the information we're getting from the West. So do not automatically believe any stories coming from the West. And once we have the knowledge, once we have the information, once we have the political education, we are able to better question the motives and the intents of the sources of those information that, that we're getting. And it's also important to get primary sources. So if the West, if the US, if Europe are talking about another country, shouldn't we do homework on that country? Isn't that really important to, to, uh, to uh, even if it's, it's an enemy, we consider to be an enemy. Like if we're talking about Netanyahu, we have to study Netanyahu. <laughs> if we're talking about we hate capitalism, we have to study why we hate capitalism. Don't just say I hate capitalism because like, well, I got cheated out of my check. It's like, no, it's a larger structure. So the enemy of the West don't necessarily believe the enemy of the West is our enemy. Do homework on that. And come to find out they most likely are not our enemy because they are also part of an anti-imperialist struggle. They are also part of nationalizing their resources, which is what happened in Venezuela. And I'll just say this before I turn off my mic again. I have had conversation with some people. Well, why is Venezuela hoarding the oil? Well, if you understand what sanctions are, you understand they don't have the materials to uh, process that oil to distribute to people. And the fact that other countries are forced uh, against um, assisting Venezuela in helping to refine and distribute that oil, that's the stuff we need to do homework on. But if we just believe the Western narrative, it's like, well, Chavez is just hoarding the oil. So that's what we mean when we talk about simply not believing that the West enemies are our enemies because there's a story behind everything. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jamila. Do you have any thoughts, Mark? Uh, no, I have nothing to add. I thought that was a, a very comprehensive and complete response. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, um, we're gonna start to bring it to a close. Just two more questions. First question for y'all is how should organizers Working on Palestine, respond to the sentiment, what about Congo, Haiti, Sudan, African issues don't receive as much attention? How do we respond to that? Well, you know, it's it's all the same war. Uh, and, and, you know, it, when, you, when you strike a blow against Zionism, you strike a blow against those who are trying to cause problems anywhere in the world, uh, you know, through the empire. And and so this this is you know 
revolution is not something that happens in 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 one month or in in one year you know it it, it is it, it is a dynamic thing you know it 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 changes just as everything changes all of the time and and the job of revolutionaries is is to recognize that change and to seize the moment and uh we're in a moment now when one of our 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 worst enemies is under fire you know by the planet and and so when the entire world is massing to take out zionism does it make sense for us as africans to say well y'all can do that we're going to go over here and fight someplace else uh no let's 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 get them let's take them out i mean because if we take out zionism then it makes our struggles in these other countries that much easier Z imperialism becomes much weaker because we've done that. So when we fight for others, we fight for ourselves. And uh, you know, it, it, you know, in another season, uh, you know, you know, Congo will be at the center, and another season, Haiti will be at the at the center. Uh, you know, things change, but but uh, these circumstances are are very much things that we have to be aware of and uh, you know, in tune with so that we can make, be most effective in our struggle against uh, our, our global enemy. Absolutely, thank you so much. How about you, Jamila? I thought that was his thing, thank you. <laughs> and then final question, how do we address African nationalists who say Arabs enslaved Africans and still control North Africa? Places like Tunisia, Morocco, et cetera. Was Gaddafi an Arab? Why did he fight for Pan-Africanism? Oh, my goodness. Well, I discussed that in the first half of the presentation. I'll just say in terms of Gaddafi, he understood, as we've been talking about, there is a common enemy. There's a common enemy of imperialism. He understood that military forces that were funded and provided weapons and infrastructure, they were also an enemy of the people. And I, I don't know what else to say to that. He was very clear about that. And also, I think it's important for folks to read the Green Book because he lays out a plan. He uh, lays out uh, the struggle um, to recognize indigenous peoples of Libya. He recognizes all of these things that we have addressed. And this is actions, again, to, um, to front, to forward, to initiate uh, a united uh, African economy. I think those are very important things. And so as we again identify as Africans, it's not uh, because, well, we look a certain way or here is a particular texture. Uh, being African to us and African identity is political and ideological first and foremost. So this idea of, well, you have curly hair, versus kinky hair and your nose isn't broad or this, that, or the other. Barack Obama is an African for all intents and purposes, but he is not an African ideologically or politically. So we do not align with Barack Obama. So the, the same with Colin Powell, the same with all of these people, Linda Thomas Greenville, as was mentioned. So uh, anyone who is supporting uh, the African liberation struggle, we align with those people, whether it is the nor Northern Irish Republican, wh whoever. And so they may not identify as Africans politically, but they understand the struggle of African liberation and the move towards Pan-Africanism, which is our objective, the United Socialist Africa. So they understand those struggles and we work together. So it's not a matter of, well, uh, Gaddafi was an Arab. Yes, he identifies Arab, but he also forged Pan-Africanism. And I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that Gaddafi provides important lessons for us uh, because it's actually counter-revolutionary to write off entire populations of people just because of their ethnic or racial identity. Uh, you know, human beings are capable of transformation capable of changing. And Gaddafi himself underwent a, a number of changes. Uh, you know, at one point he was, uh, you know, staunch Arab nationalist. Uh, but at the end of his life, he was in fact a sterling Pan-Africanist. Uh, he, uh, you know, as, as was mentioned, was trying to 
uh, establish a, a gold-backed uh, Pan-African uh, uh, currency uh, that was going to essentially devalue the French franc. And if you look at the emails, which are available online, if you want to see Hillary Clinton's emails, her staff is, is exchanging emails with uh, people in the French government about the need to take out Gaddafi. And the, one of the reasons they give specifically is this currency that he's trying to establish. Uh, and uh, they also wanted access to his oil. And the, the, the other thing is that when he was uh, in the leadership of African Union, he was making sincere and honest efforts to unify the continent, uh, something that Africans have been trying to do for a long time. But, you know, people can talk the talk, but, you know, walking the walk is a more difficult thing. And uh, he, he did the difficult thing because even within his own country, when there was really stiff opposition, uh, they had what they regarded as a border crisis, just like white people in, a, in the U.S. say that we have one, with, with uh, African people coming across the border into Libya looking for work. He threw open the borders and said, come on in. Africa is Africa. You want to come work in Libya, come on in and work in Africa. And it's that which earned him the hostility of reactionary and racist uh, Arabs in his country and who were exploited by and those tensions were exploited by the CIA. Uh, they were the ones that the CIA armed, you know, and AFRICOM led in the effort to take out his at the Gaddafi's government. And in the end, you know, African people in Libya understood the sacrifices that Gaddafi made for for them, because Gaddafi died at the hands of a mob. They took a bayonet and rammed it up his rectum disembowel this man. And lying beside him, lying beside his dead body, were Black African brothers, you know, with rifles who were giving their lives to protect this man. I think that speaks volumes about how they regarded him. And, and I think it speaks volumes about what's possible. Just because somebody today is racist and, and counter-revolutionary, uh, but experiences oppression because of the same factors that cause oppression for us, uh, just because they're backwards thinking now doesn't mean that they will always be that way. Our job as revolutionaries is to try and help them to think clearly. Thank you so much to you both. Um, we are just about at the end of time for this webinar today. So I want to say thank you to Jamila Bordon and to Mark P. Fancher for speaking so clearly and laying down that analysis of why we need to build unity between the Arab, Palestinian, and African liberation struggles, why imperialism is terrified of that unity, why that unity is going to take Israel and Zionism out. So thank y'all both. Um, I want to definitely leave a space for any final remarks you might want to make, anything, any projects of yours that you want folks to check out. Um, please, the floor is yours. I'll just say thank you once again. I'm just truly appreciative of this opportunity to uh, share this information and to organize with you all. And uh, this is a wonderful session that I look forward to next week. Thank you. What she said. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I honestly thank you. And, um, you know, I think we just all need to be sure. Uh, we're going to win this. You know, it, it, we, we've seen so much happen. Uh, in, in recent decades. And, um, you know, it's, it's a good moment, exciting moment. And uh, we, we, we will be victorious. Thank you so much. Zionism will fall. Palestine will be free. Africa will be free. And as Jamila said, please join us for the final webinar in this series next Tuesday, 7 p.m. Eastern. We're going to be talking about the clear difference between Zionism and Judaism. So please join us. And thank you so much again, Mark and Jamila. Have a good rest of your evening. Forward, everybody.